two guys, one bitch. As for where I think I'm going to be in five years, I don't really ever feel that. I don't care. And you said, obviously, a belt. No, I, I'm not a guy who's going to come here and tell you that I want the belt. How arrogant. I just lost Arlovsky. I'm not telling you I'm going to go and beat the shit out of, like, Francis and Curtis Blades and all those John Joneses at heavyweight now. Like, come on. If that happens, great. You know, hey, one step at a time. You never know what can happen. I'm not going to say I can't. Of course I could. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Two Guys, One Bench. We just got off an interview with Tanner Bozer, UFC heavyweight, and he's getting ready for a fight against a career uh, veteran, Latifi. Uh, so it's going to be an awesome fight. Uh, Darrell? Yeah, it was great to hear from someone, especially from Alberta. He's an um, Edmonton kid, well, Bonneville, and just hearing a bit about his approach on how he goes into things and even the mindset walking up to the octagon. Yeah, you can definitely tell it's fight week. He's He looks amped up and ready to rock already. So uh, stay tuned and listen to this awesome interview. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Two guys, one bench interview. Uh, we got Tanner Bozer, who is an up-and-coming UFC heavyweight. He's out there smashing dudes. And uh, thanks for having us. Uh, you know, take your time here, Tanner. Nothing like smashing dudes, eh? Smashing dudes, man. <laughs> dude smashing um i love that grill uh can you tell us how you lost that tooth nope no no okay nope. um well i have a bit of a background in uh in uh karate um I, I live in japan 11 years uh black belt in kyokushin and uh i you know i stumbled upon a few interviews where you talked about uh, growing up as a kid doing martial arts, and I've seen some old pictures on your Instagram with the old gi on. Um, so how much has that been a part of your, your journey, you know, starting off traditional martial arts and then all the way to now where you're smashing dudes? Uh, it's definitely a big part. I did karate from when I was 11 to when I was like 19, I think. Uh, Shitoryu, not Kyokushin. Kyokushin's, in terms of combat, it's for sure the best uh, style of karate that to translate into MMA or full contact fighting of some sort. Yeah. But uh, my, you know, I did karate is what got me interested in martial arts and got me kind of trying to relate to UFC fighters. Like when I'm watching it, like I really liked Lyoto Machida uh, because he was a karate guy and, you know, gave me inspiration when I was young and I'm like, Oh, that's really cool. Like maybe I could do that. So yeah, the traditional martial arts had a, uh, uh, definitely, definitely an influence and an impact on me when I was when I was young. Yes. So you mentioned Lyoto Machida, but um, who are some of the other fighters you kind of looked up? Sorry, I'm, find me walking here. I got to go get my charger. My phone's at six percent, but I'm going to keep talking to you guys while I go to my room here. Uh, Lyoto Machida, yeah. Earlier, my dad liked Randy Couture. Um, I've always been a big fan of Clay Guida and Frankie Edgar. They were some of my favorites and still are. Awesome. Well, they're definitely not heavyweights, but uh, what, oh, did heavyweights. Like, what did you like about their, their style of fighting? Oh, uh, I liked the grit. I liked um, how they were always in crazy fights. And even though they would get like absolutely rocked or, or knocked uh, down multiple times, they'd never give up and they were just, tough as nails that's what i liked about them and still like about them um in terms of heavyweights if you asked and i wasn't listening my favorite heavyweight of all time was junior dos santos nice yeah yeah i could definitely see some uh some similarities in your you know you're he's probably what 240 ish and and about six three but he he moves around so light and um one of my favorite things about you is just how how you move around and, you know, you're, you're one of the quickest heavyweights out there for sure. Thanks. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I have too many similarities to Dos Santos. He moved forward a lot, uh, like a ton of 
belief in his one punch ability, his power, but he, he did have really good boxing, uh, good spin kicks. Uh, he all around guy, if he was losing on the feet, he'd take guys down and beat them in mount or something like that. So, uh, yeah, he was, he was awesome. Um, but yeah, we were both around the same weight, I guess. Uh, he's taller than like he's six, four. So he got a little height on me, but, um, yeah, he was, he was awesome to watch for sure. Definitely. I mean, um, so, uh, you're from Alberta, you're from even more of a desolate place, Edmonton, uh, Bonneville, I think I read, which is God, that must be terrible in the winter, but, <laughs> um, how is that? You, you know, I always hear Joe Rogan talk about, you know, people that live in harsher temperatures are tougher, but I definitely believe like, you know, growing up in Calgary, um, just these winters, you know, you, you get, you get tougher that way. Um, does that influence your, your toughness at all? Do you think? I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of people that live where I live that are giant pussies. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't so if we lived outside then that might be a factor but we don't we all have heated houses and heated cars you know our homeless are probably tougher that's for sure <laughs> yeah where our, do you think the motivation to fight um professionally came from like were you always thinking that even as a little kid did you always think like i want to fight when i get older or was it something that maybe in your teens that you started seeing watching ufc and thought i could do that for a living yeah, it wasn't until I was uh, like in high school, like maybe maybe grade eleven or something, where I started thinking like, uh, you know, maybe maybe I could try that one day. But I was never, I never really like believed I was gonna do it as a career or something like that. I just wanted to do it, and then basically one day I just said fuck it and did it. You know. Nice. So uh, going from that, where did you just walk into? You know, a uh, local uh mixed martial arts gym in edmonton or how did that go down i had my first two pro fights actually when i was still living in bonneville so uh wow. i didn't i didn't actually start training till after my first pro fight because i was a fucking idiot <laughs> wow <laughs> well yeah i think that's a good approach uh but like i said i think you're a tough bastard so what i wanted to say also about alberta is um, not too many people are aware, but it's a rough place. Like if you live in a small town and you go to the bar, you're probably going to get in a fight. Uh, you're going to like, we're not, we are nice people as Canadians, but you know, small town Alberta, I grew up in car stairs and you know, we had loony night every Friday, you go to the pub and just get smashed and guaranteed fights at the end of the night. Like there's a, definitely a toughness there. What's it like up in Bonneville? Yeah. Um, I mean, rest in peace to the wetlander, but yeah, that place uh, saw more street fights than, than most other parts, that's for sure. So uh, yeah, it was definitely a common recreational activity if that's what you were into. Yeah. So transitioning from obviously that growing up to where you are now, you're in fight week, like you were talking to us before we started rolling. What's fight, le fight week um like for you right now especially with like covid and restrictions are things opened up or do you have to like stay pretty much in your room or just the gym yeah we're we're quarantined right now um we have one day of or whatever ish of quarantine till our covid results come back and then when they come back negative then we can leave the premises with like a ufc driver like chauffeur we can't really go anywhere like they would take us to like the grocery store somewhere like that if we needed or they'll take us to the performance institute to train if we book a time but we can't actually go anywhere so although vegas is is opened up uh we are we are locked down nice uh, i just want to talk about just waiting it's just sitting in the hotel and waiting <laughs> do you do you run into a lot of the other fighters while you're there or you know your opponent at all or well, I mean, I'll see him at some point. I'm sure I haven't seen him yet, but yeah, you run into some of the other fighters. If you have to go get your COVID tested about the same time, or you're both running downstairs to grab your food or something like that. So yeah, you see some of the other guys, but um, I haven't seen Latifi just yet. Yeah. Um, you know, just talking about your, your entrance into the UFC, you actually defended your belt uh, with the unified numerous times. Your last time you actually took out my boy Kilkenny. Uh, <laughs> And um, 
just with leg kicks like that was that was uh, brutal I can imagine what he felt like but that's another thing I love about your low kicks um yeah um so getting right into the UFC they didn't really give you much time to adjust you were dropped in there with some big names and um I mean, you've been fighting some top guys, like your last fight, Andre Arvlowski, obviously one of the greatest heavyweights to, to do it. Um, what's it been like just getting dropped into the, the wolves, so to speak? It's been fun, man. I, I fight whoever they tell me I'm fighting. So, yeah, Andre Arvlowski and Cyril Gaon are definitely two of the tougher guys I've fought, but... Uh, things went perfectly for me against Felipe Linz, but I mean, he's no slouch either. He won the PFL tournament. So yeah, I ain't getting any lob balls. That's for sure. But, oh, well, I'm, I'm just, I'm here to fight whoever. I don't really care. Yeah. Speaking of that victory over Linz, that was probably one of the best, uh, combination knockouts I've ever seen. Um, and just how you transitioned from knocking him down. And then you already had that hand cocked to finish him. That was pretty, pretty amazing. I mean, um, to be a com, you know, a combination finisher like that, um, what kind of you know practice does that take? You know, a lot of these heavyweights is just a one punch kind of deal, but you're you're hitting guys with three, four, five hit combos, right? Depends what you have. If you if you're a big big guy and you got one punch knockout power, go for it. And if you're me and you have to hit somebody with five or six shots, then you better learn to keep your balance and uh, throw combos from a decent stance without, you know, falling into the guy or jamming, you know, stuffing your work. You have someone hurt and you end up kind of jamming yourself. Um, yeah, it's just a different skill set, but it's, uh, what I do. Being at heavyweight, um, is it a bigger influence on your game plan when someone has power, even if they're not the most skilled, um, individual, let's say they have just crazy power. Is that harder to adjust to someone that's more technical or which one's harder for you? Well, it really depends on the individual, right? It, that's a completely case by case basis. Some guys got insane power and you can't really quantify it. Hard to train for how, you know, a guy like, for instance, maybe like Francis and Ganyu, there's just not too many people on earth that have that kind of power. It's just a, just a, just a thing you're going to have to try and uh, get around. Uh, some guys are extremely technical, like Cyril Gaon. He's a definitely, um, he's definitely kind of a, a mastermind in there. So it depends. I don't know if one's harder than the other. I think it depends on the individual fighter and circumstances. Yeah, definitely. Um, but you did, you know, have two performance bonuses, which is pretty awesome. What's it like getting one of those? I only got one performance bonus. Oh, really? Well, Wikipedia's lying to me. <laughs> yeah, the performance bonus when I fought Pessoa. Whoa, uh, you guys there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I got a performance bonus when I fought Pessoa, not when I fought Linz. Oh, really? You didn't get a bonus for that knockout? Wow. Or didn't. Some girl got an arm bar and Ronda Rousey tweeted about it. So fuck me in the ass. I didn't get a fucking... <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was that was one of my favorite KOs ever. Um, but what I find more remarkable about you is not only are you out there knocking dudes and and um, you know pulling off these awesome combos, moving around like a, a lightweight, um, your shit talking game is on point. Um, in your interviews, you're <laughs> you're dropping bombs on the reporters, trying to tell you to lose weight or to get down to light heavyweight and shit like that. Like some of your um, and just after, you know, your, your interviews after the wins are pretty amazing. Thanks. Um, yeah, I was, I was surprised. I'm like, I'm not, I'm not really much of a shit talker. I like never shit talk my opponents, but when you said the reporters, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, a lot of them bother me. A lot of them, their questions are dumb a lot of the time. And I don't find very many of the articles I see overly respectful and it gives me a disdain for them you know the old like i have more in common with my opponent than i do with these fuckers talking shit about every time somebody loses they should retire you know or switch camps uproot their life get a new coach this that or the other thing you know what i mean they're it's real easy to criticize and as soon as you fire back at one of these fucking plugs they're usually just whining about it instantly too so um yeah i find it i i uh, find it entertaining to fire back at them when i can yeah so I know in like the NFL and NBA, the the athletes are kind of required to do interviews and everything, and they got to be 
real PC about shit. With the UFC and your inter- interviews, can you pretty much say what you want? Are you obligated to make a certain amount in a week, like of interviews? And do you have to like be, I don't know, like handle them a little nicer than you would like? Or are you allowed to just say whatever the fuck's on your mind? Uh, UFC does mandate a certain amount for you on fight week. You'll have X amount of interviews you, you have to do. Uh obviously the higher up on the card you know if you're a main event or co-main event you'll have to do more than if you're on the undercard and things like that but we're not really obligated to answer anything in a certain way you know we can we can definitely be a little less uh P, you know pc i guess than other athletes could be but still don't say something stupid because while you can say what you want they're gonna put it out there and then if you said something you know out of control or ridiculous you might you might you can get fired for it or something so you can say what you want but there's repercussions definitely um i think the first time i, I kind of uh heard you was on the the danger cats podcast uh a few times and i'm like who is this guy uh is that kind of just being on podcasting and, and on air a bit helped you to get ready for these fuck stick interviews uh that people are trying to you know, provoke you with? No, I've been fielding these interviews for way longer than I ever, you know, I did a, yeah, I did a handful of podcasts with Hacksaw for Danger Cat. But I've been fielding these interviews way longer than I was ever doing podcasts or anything like that. I'm just, I'm pretty comfortable with it for whatever reason. I don't know why. (laughs) Can you uh, walk us through what goes through your mind during like the walk to the octagon? Like regardless if you got fans or not, um, like, what are you thinking about in that, like, one or one to two minutes right there, right there during the walk? Well, I, I think that's an individual experience. But for me, when my walkout music comes on, it's just, I'm just gone. And then I, I walk out and everything's ice. I'm just ready to fight at that point. I don't really think much anymore. Nice. Um, so uh, do you use the same walkout music all the time and you got this, your favorite song or something different? I change it up each time and it usually is something that to me, at least a little bit lyrically in my head pertains somehow to that fight or circumstances of that fight or something. Definitely. Um, yeah. When I was back in, you know, Japan um, and, and training with some of the, the guys out there, it was definitely stoic to see some of these guys go out and, you know, not even get phased going to the, the ring uh i you know i i had a good time faking it but in in my head i was fucking definitely uh it was hard for me um but one thing you know when i was fighting uh in the ring do you, like in the whole the entire fight always seems like a bit of a dream to me like i can't remember parts of it like what is that like for you you know you've had quite a few fights now and it's is it do you remember everything or do you just is it like a dream yeah that's a good way to describe it. Yeah. I don't think, ugh, no, you don't remember everything. And if you do, the sequences are off. It's not necessarily in order the way you remember it. And I'm not even talking about if you got hit hard a bunch, even yeah. fights where you didn't get hit, you kind of remember it out of sequence. You remember parts. You don't necessarily remember everything. I think it's because your brain is in such a high stress uh, life or death check te- technically situation that it diverts energy from like storing memory to uh, just uh, sharpening your reflexes and being so present that it says it's do or die that it doesn't prioritize uh memory or something like that yeah it's uh it's hard to explain to anybody else but it's like you're in a dream state and then like i've like let's say that combo you finished lens with that must have been like a crazy flow state like you're not even thinking at that point it's just real no, i do like a bunch and I can describe what went through my head at that moment. I hit him with the overhand and I saw, and I saw him wobble a little bit, but I saw his eyes and I could tell from his eyes that he was hurt. And I jumped in and my head went like, it was like hit him in the face. And it went, I hit him a bunch. I didn't, I didn't know what I hit him with till after the, the fight, you know, it was face, 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 face. And then it was done, but it was all just like, it was like green lights in your head. Like you hit him in the face, like nice, 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 you know, like face, 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 just bang, 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 bang. And yeah, I have no idea what the combo was until after, you know, it's not like a practice combo. It was just, I hit him a bunch of times. 
and it wasn't anything crazy. People think it was a sick combo, which is cool, but it was like left, right, left, right, left, right. You know, I didn't open up with like a fucking deadly boxing combo where I hit him with like, you know, head, body, body, head. And, you know, I just hit him in the face a bunch of times and he fell. And then, yeah, I had my hand cocked and I fell into him with that hammer fist, which again is obviously isn't like a practice move. You just, I just did it. So yeah, I guess I was in sort of a flow state. You get into that kill zone where, you know, someone's hurt and your body just takes over and you, yeah, put the, put the finish on him. Are you ever surprised by your performance in the octagon? Like what I mean by that is say you're fighting and you drop someone or wobble someone. Are you ever surprised? Like, Oh wow. That like, I wasn't expecting it to do as much damage as it did or when you're wow. throwing, you are you throwing with the intent? Like, yeah, if this lands, it's going to drop him. Like, just from someone with no fight experience, I just kind of want to know how that all mm. works. No, I mean, if you're throwing a hard punch, you always hope that it's going to hurt them, right? But you don't know what's going to hurt them because you don't know how everything's going to land or if it's going to land. So, yeah, you have to be reactionary. But I don't know. I don't know if I'm ever sometimes I guess for a second you're surprised you're like, oh that hurt him and then you got to go in but you're not like wow I hurt him like you know you're training to hurt somebody you're training to do damage so if it does its job then that's just perfect yeah and um I'm just a little interested in like your training methods because I you know I coach MMA as well um and you know what kind of do you focus on like a lot of combos when you're hitting pads and stuff like that because no, there's no set combos. Cause I find more that the more my kind of fighters can learn combos and memorize just banging out like a five, six shot combo, then they're more likely to use it in, in a sparring session. Um, how does that work with you? Or if, if not, like, how do you, how do you, you know, practice? How do you drill necessarily? Well, I have some combos, but they're not huge. They're maximum five punches i guess but then you can do that if you apply it depending on where they are you could then basically instantly apply another combo so it might look like one big combo but really it's not or you know you hit somebody with a few punches but it was just like a one two and then all of a sudden you see another combo opportunity and uh it's more the way i uh, my coach coaches me it's more sequences and I wouldn't say so many set combos. There's a few, yeah, but it's a lot of recognizing when's the right time to do what and then incorporating what you can do it at that time, I guess. I don't know. It's hard to explain. Yeah, it just, I understand it. It's interesting. I'm just, as a coach, it's always interesting for me to hear what kind of training methods you do. And um, one other thing I noticed that you definitely, um, you've, you've shaped up a, a bunch over the last year. Um, how has, you know, your strength conditioning changed and how has that helped you? A lot more weights is how it's changed. And it, it has helped a lot. Uh, during the start of COVID, I couldn't train with groups or do anything for a long time. And I had to improvise and I was able to, well, I'm not able. I, only thing I could really do was more strength and conditioning, just not in a group setting on my own and just lift a lot more weights and, I noticed the changes and it wasn't just the way I looked or strength wise, I was actually able to like punch and kick better. So for whatever reason, so I've kept up with that. Nice. So you're doing a lot of the compound movements like deadlifting and, and squatting and all that kind of power yeah. stuff. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So what does a normal day look like for you? A day of training, like, get up at 4 30 train two or three times can you take us through that <laughs> like 4 30 get up at 10 30 <laughs> okay and train at like 1 p.m or something like that and then train again at 7 30 or something like that i usually train twice a day sometimes it's three times but usually it's twice so usually one's a strength and conditioning and the other is like an mma or grappling or kickboxing or so again, sometimes three, or maybe there's not a strength and conditioning that day. And I happen to have, you know, a kickboxing, jujitsu and MMA or something like that. Awesome. Yeah, definitely. That's funny. 4.30 in the morning. Yeah. That's, uh, those are some crazy bastards, but generally I, I would say you want to be ready to be 
able to fight in the evening at all times, right? That's why I always train later to see so if you're going to fight, it's usually in the evening, right? Unless you go somewhere else in the, in the world. Right. Well, unless you go somewhere else, then you have to fight. Like when I fought in Abu Dhabi, I'm fighting at, even yeah. there, I'm fighting at like four in the fucking morning. So it's <laughs> stupid fucking time, you know? So just to make it uh, on prime time in TV in the States. Yeah. So it's, I fought in a lot of places and I've had to adapt to the clock. So I don't really prioritize when I'm training, I guess. I just have times where I typically do train and I work my schedule around those. But when I'm somewhere like here in Vegas, I'm probably going to end up fighting our time. It's something like 3.30 ish. So that's obviously the time when I will try and train this week. But yeah. Can you take us through... Um... After a loss, how hard is it to shake that? Or is it just on to the next one? Or does that stick with you for a while? You can shake it and still be on to the next one. And it still sticks with you. It's not like you ever just are happy about it all of a sudden. I'm on to the next one, but I'm still bothered by my last loss. That's how it is. It, you know, you got you to gotta be ready to go on to the next one. Because when you win a fight, you know, yeah, you forget a little bit. You don't forget, but it takes off some of the shitty feeling from your last loss, but it, it depends on the loss too. Some are easier to be like, Oh fuck, whatever. Like that sucks, but I lost and other ones you kick yourself in the ass for a long time about. So it all depends on the nature of it. Definitely. Um, and speaking of that last loss versus uh, Arvlosky, well, that guy's been in the game forever. I mean, um, I couldn't imagine just being across the octagon from that monster. But um, speaking of which, like in, in the next five years, where do you see yourself as a fighter? Because that guy's been going for almost 20 and still staying relevant. So um, do you plan on doing this for quite a long time? Um, what are, you know, what are some of your goals? Obviously trying to get a belt. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. So first of all, yes, Arlovsky is uh, a legend. No, I wasn't. Like, oh, shit, that's Arlovsky. You know, I had a job to do, and I, and I didn't do it well enough. It was too close. It's a matter of opinion who won that fight, and the judges' opinions were that he won the fight, and I lost. So that sucks. That loss really fucking sucks. It's like one punch away on either side from the person winning or losing. If I would have won on that exact same performance, whether the judges just saw it slightly different and gave me the win, uh, I would be fine with it. I would have won. So that's it's a matter of opinion in that yes Arlovsky has been fighting forever and uh he's still relevant kudos to him the guy's fucking brilliant he's been you know he's he's making a, a, an absolute killing to fight idiots like me so congratulations to him he, he did it uh as for where I think I'm gonna be in five years I don't really ever feel that I don't care and you said obviously a belt. No, I, I'm not a guy who's going to come here and tell you that I want the belt. How arrogant. I just lost Arlovsky. I'm not telling you I'm going to go and beat the shit out of like Francis and Curtis Blades and all those John Jones is at heavyweight now. Like, come on. If that happens, great. You know, hey, one step at a time. You never know what can happen. I'm not going to say I can't. Of course I could. You know, if the stars aligned and things just went great for me. But I got Iller Latifi in front of me. And after that, it depends what happens in this fight. How can you see yourself anywhere in five years? You can, you have to look at every fork in the road. If I beat him, well, I'm going to get a guy that's probably a gatekeeper type to the top 15, maybe a big Ben type. And then if I beat him, Oh, well, I'm going to be fighting a top 15, maybe a top 10 guy. That's so many ifs. If I lose this fight, I'm going to be fighting another asshole who's on a losing streak. And if I lose that one, I'm out. And then I got to figure something else out. So Hard to say where you see yourself in five years. It's a very, very um, volatile career. Yeah, oh, that makes perfect sense. Yeah. Um, and you're obviously very down earth and your approach on it, unlike other guys would have just given us the typical answer that you always hear. But <laughs> yeah. the fact that you kind of assessed everything and have thought it through shows a lot about you. Yeah, thanks. All right, man. Well, we don't want to take any more of your time. Um, I know you, you got a lot to think about, but best of luck uh, this week. We're cheering for you, man, here in Alberta. Yeah, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Okay. Thanks, Tanner. Peace. 
All right, guys. Hope you enjoyed the interview with Tanner. Wish him best of luck on his upcoming fight. Don't forget to tune in next week when we'll have another interview for you. Definitely. And don't forget to eat big, train hard, and always be fight ready. Ding! Two guys, one bench. Shit talking. Strength sports. Combat sports. Game over. Inside Edition.